Today on The Grave Talks, Haunted Lake Tomahawk with author Mark Palbicki. Welcome to Haunted Lake Tomahawk, where author Mark Palbicki embarked on a personal journey exploring the ghost stories and legends in Lake Tomahawk, Wisconsin. These are all stories shared by residents of Lake Tomahawk and nearby towns. Mark also investigated some of these locations alongside his paranormal investigation team, Fulcrum. Their unique approach focuses solely on places believed to be haunted by people they actually knew during their earthly lives, like Donna from the Village Cafe and Buckskin, an eccentric man who Mark suspects may have followed him home. There's also a remarkable orb video captured by security cameras in Mark's mother's home following her passing. You can see it by clicking on the link in the show notes. Today, a conversation about Haunted Lake Tomahawk, Memoirs of a Ghost Hunter, with author Mark Palbicki. Mark, I want to first start a question that I like to ask everyone. What started your interest in the paranormal? Was there an experience that happened to you? I know there's one in the book, but had you had experiences kind of your whole life? Yeah, I I, I have. I think it really started, I got hit by a car, and I had an out-of-body experience where it was touch and go the first few hours there, and the next day I was out cold, and I had visitors come to visit me, and I knew exactly who came and what their conversations were. But the thing is, I was up on the ceiling. I was out in the hallway. I was in the elevator with them. And I experienced all that. And I'm like, what happened to me? And at the time, this was back in 1977, you just didn't come out like you do nowadays and say, oh, you had a near-death experience or you had an out-of-body experience. Something like that was kind of taboo back in the days. I was brought up uh, Roman Catholic, and I had two aunts that were Catholic nuns. You didn't say anything. You kept it to yourself. And plus my family... We had the old stories, and I don't know if they were ghost stories or, you know, I, I had an aunt that was, we were kind of scared of her, actually. She would have premonitions, you know, and she would predict things and stuff, and it kind of ran on my mom's side of the family. So I'm thinking when I had this trauma, it really kind of engaged my psychic side of my brain or however you want to call it. Um, I did get a hold of Dr. Bruce Grayson over at the University of Virginia. And I've been involved with studies with Bruce for the past 20, 25 years on near-death experiences. You know, I talked to someone else recently who, as a child, had a near-death experience. And he said that was what changed everything. It was like things opened to him. Yeah. And he just saw, you know, it was just different after that. My first experience, which I didn't know at the time, and I didn't figure out till later in life, I was five years old. I had my tonsils out, and I had a blood clot in my throat, and I almost died. And then I didn't speak for a while. I was real quiet and had to go through um, speech therapy and stuff when I was in grade school and stuff. But I was, I could feel that I was a little different. I had like wisdom beyond my years. And I could f- kind of feel things and sense things. And that was that was back in grade school already. Did you ever live in a place that you considered was haunted? Or does it kind of more go with you? All places are haunted. Any, I think anywhere, <laughs> the, every, anywhere I, there's the human true. Yeah. experience is, there, is haunted. Um, the house I live in, Slinger here, um, we've had experiences with, different smells like one day the upper floor we live in like a chalet in the upper floor and i'm in the the same room the loft where that was my wife donna it smelled like oranges it was in the middle of winter time and only thing i could think of it was my dad and it was something that it was a shared experience because donna 
experienced it as well. As well. Oh, I always think that's so interesting when that second person really validates what you just experienced. Because you could convince yourself of a number of things, but when you have somebody else say, no, I smelt it too, that really validates it. So somehow, did you like start doing paranormal investigations earlier in your life, or was this after you got to Lake no. Tomahawk? No, it was after Lake Tomahawk. Okay. And when uh, Mike Chevalier asked me if I would do that, and I, I, I had interest in it. So I said, sure, I had, I had an app. It was like this ghost app. I don't give any credit to it. I don't think it's, I think it's more psychological where you yourself, you're, you're reading into it what, what you want. But I had that and it just went bonkers when I was in that uh, VFW post. How did you and Donna, your wife, end up going to Lake Tomahawk? And you've lived there for quite a while now, right? 25 years, I think. 26 years. And, and that was a synchronicity. I started saving fox head bottles and glasses and beer trays and stuff because that's what my my grandfather drank. One day at work, this uh, a guy comes up to him. I'm, I'm in a, a new plant. I worked for Briggs and Stratton, and I was at the Menominee Falls plant. He comes up to me. I, I was in the model shop. I was in the international model shop. He asked me if I could polish his beer bottle opener for him. I said, oh, sure. You know, I made it nice and shiny, and I gave it back to him. And he said that he had a whole cigar box full of them. I said, see if there's any Fox had bottle openers in there. And next day, sure enough, there, there it was. He gave it to me. And so I was like, oh, of course. I said, where you, where you get these from? He said, well, Grandma's got a place up in the Northwoods. I mean, like Tomahawk that we're getting rid of, an old cabin. We just happened to be looking for one. I said, do you mind if... Donna and myself, we go up there and take a look at it. And that's that's how it started. The the place actually should have been torn down. It was, they had like a family of skunks living in it and the, the door was rotted off and it was actually scary. When my my kids were little, we had to set a tent up on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> All because of Turned a beer bottle be- opener, you ended up there. Yeah. And there's a picture in in the book, Grandpa Casey's Beverage of Choice, Foxhead, and there's the bottle opener. Yeah. Isn't that funny how life works out if you just kind of kind of let it and, and things sort of lead you where you need to be? But Yeah, it's signs and signals, and if you can read them. So what got so, you interested? Was it kind of living in the community and hearing stories? What got you interested in writing the book Haunted Lake Tomahawk, because this is really a lot of different stories from Lake Tomahawk and really close nearby. I would drink coffee with the old guys in the morning. I call it the crow's nest, but it's Tony at the BP. I like to give him a shout out. He, he sells my books and he's just a super host. He puts up with us. You know, I've been drinking coffee with them guy for 25 years. Now I'll take it back 23 years. The first two years I'd go in there It'd be a group talking. I'd go get my coffee. You could hear a pin drop. I'd walk in and <laughs> nothing. They wouldn't say a, a word to me. And that went on for like two years. And one morning I came in and I might have been a little hungover or something from the night before. And I went to get the coffee and I didn't say good morning to them. And a wise ass says, and I'm leaving. And, I, and as I'm walking out the door, I hear a wise ass say, well, aren't you going to say good morning? And I turned around and I went off on him. I said, I've been coming in here for two freaking years. And you're going to give me crap <laughs> for not saying good morning. And that guy turned out to be Airport Charlie, which is still with us. And his wife actually has a story in the book with, with their dog. Yeah, that's kind of how it started. One of the old guys, this is Jim, he gave me the first ghost story up there. But then he stopped coming in. And he worked for the uh, little Bobby, the furnace guy. And I wanted to have his initial story in there. Then when I heard 20, 20 years ago, I couldn't get a hold of him. He wouldn't answer his phone. He wouldn't answer his texts and stuff. Just by happenstance, I'm up here for a week this last week. Who walks into the gas? It's, it's Jim, the guy I was looking for. So he gave, he gave me another story. That's not so in the book then. 
it's not in the book. And I got about four or five more stories that aren't in the book right now. So do you think as you collect more stories, you'll get another book done? I don't know. I don't Depending know. If I on have it. it wasn't easy to do because I kind of type one finger at a time. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, that would be hard. <laughs> it took like yeah, it took time like six consuming. Years. It's a minor miracle the book even took place <laughs> because we're down in Fort Myers and, it, and I met an editor and a publisher down there. And it was the Golf Coast Writers Association. I like to say hi to those folks. I'm a member of them now, but this is Judy Lewis. She was my original publisher and my editor. And she passed away. And now I was maybe a halfway through the book, three quarters through the book. And all of a sudden I lost. So, so I contacted the club or the association and, and they, they, they told me that she died but they didn't have uh, access to any of her files or her emails and stuff. But luckily, I did save some of her emails. I had it in a, a separate file. And one of my members of my team, Fulcrum, my paranormal research team, Scott Mortier, he happens to be the assistant DA for Fond du Lac County, which is just north of me here in Slinger. And he can type and talk and do, he can multitask. I thought the book was dead when, when Judy passed away. So I told my team members, I said, hey, the book the book is off. And he said, oh, what happened? And I, you know, I explained. And Scott says, no, it's not. He says, bring it to me. I said, I only have some bits and pieces of an email. They said, bring it to me. So we worked for like two months, probably three times a week on getting the book together. If it wasn't for, for Scott, I wouldn't have this book. Oh, that's so nice that he stepped yeah, up like so, that. How did you end up getting a paranormal investigation research team together? I just asked Jeff and Pat Barney, Jeff Brown. Pat Barney was an electrical engineer. He was like, I think he was one of the head guys for the E-Tech engine for Evanroot. They would come up to the cabin for 20 plus years. They always would spend three, four days. And I said, hey, you guys want to have some fun? Because after I did that initial investigation at the uh, American Legion post, we're in a small town, so word kind of got around. Well, the Village Cafe was owned by a dear friend of mine, Donna Kleiss. Well, Donna passed away. Well, her son has started telling me that he's finding these dimes and stuff at the restaurant, and he thinks that's his mom was haunting him. I said, well, let's do an investigation over at the Village Cafe. This could be could be fun. So we, we go in there, and it's in the book. We had some activity. So as this is growing, and I'm adding team members, we're getting better equipment and, and, and the such. And I made a, a deal with myself that I was only going to investigate people that I knew in life. If I was good with them in life, I believe that in the afterlife, a part of your personality kind of it carries on. Mm -hmm. So whatever that energy is. So then we did that second investigation, and it was good. And I, I have you done investigations? I have not, and I I wouldn't mind sitting in on one. I just. I I think it's for me personally, I grew up in a haunted house as a kid and I really don't want that around me again. <laughs> and so Did you really? Yeah. So I'm fascinated by the paranormal, but then I also know what it can be like to live with it on a day to day basis. And I really don't want that again. So okay. you know what I mean? So I kind of I'm fascinated I know exactly by what it. You mean. I this is all I do all day is talk about paranormal things, but at the same time Sitting someplace quiet late at night and it, it's haunted. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm brave enough <laughs> to be honest. Real quick, that village um, cafe story with Donna and the dimes, that one really touched my heart because after I lost my dad, I started finding pennies. So I could really connect to that. And I still do to this day. And it's been oh. 30 years since he's been gone. And yeah. You know, someone might just say, yeah, so you found a dime. But like it was where he found a dime, like in a bucket of water 
or something. You know, it's not where you expect to find them. So, and that's exactly what her son conveyed to me. You yeah. know, he was finding them in the strangest places and stuff. So when you decided to write a book, it's what I found um, kind of sweet about this book was that you really do pick up on the small town feeling of it. Like you're getting the turnovers and you're talking it, to somebody and you're, and he's like, anything else for you? And you're, you say, yeah, I got any good ghost stories. <laughs> so just well, the Todd, way you, Todd. the way you approached <laughs> people and, you know, at the gas station, you ran into somebody and you say, do you have any good ghost stories? I don't, but Judy's got a ghost story. And I liked all that. It just, I lived in a sm really small town before and I just, that made me smile. Everybody knows kind of everybody, but to me, Lake Tomahawk is the way life should be. I I love it up there. It's, it's like going back in the 60s or 70s where you know your neighbors. You know, you can you can rely, you have friends. If you, you see some, you give a nod or a wave, and it's, it's a very friendly atmosphere. And it and looks, I hope it never changes. It looks absolutely beautiful. Well, the town itself ain't that beautiful, but the, the people are. Uh, there's a lot of characters this bad. <laughs> With a book, it starts right off with an interesting story because right off the bat, there's you talk to someone and they they refer you to a house that's known as the Amityville Horror, Horror House, house yeah. which of all things, you know, you hear Amityville and it's like what? And it ends up that was a very haunted house that went way back. There was another story that ends up coming up later in the book. The original girls who lived there, which I wrote about, they did contact me, and they said that there was no abuse. He said they just got the doors from wherever they could, and some of the doors had locks on them, but there was, there was no, no abuse going on there. Yeah, because in the house, you had seen there was doors with locks on the outside so it looks like people would have been locked in right it, it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't it was so, just because no. they needed doors and that's the doors they got they got the, it was tadpole timing and this is really a, a strange twist because i knew tadpole from my fishing days you own a bait shop up in Manaqua, and i knew him from the i was in the old catch and fishing club and i knew him from those days so when they're telling me the story, I said, where do I know this guy from and what his nickname was? And I found out that I actually knew the guy who had it built. It was a lot of scrap wood they got from down in the Rylander area, and, or Tomahawk area, excuse me. It came from an old brothel or a, whole, a, a seedy hotel. And that's where they're figuring that that, that energy came from, was the, the building materials that the, it was made out of. So back in the, I think it was like late 70s, that house was experiencing some really significant, it was terrorizing the family. I think we could put it that way. And so then you find out at one point that there had been an, an exorcism or a blessing performed on the house. Correct. And then come to find out you, you knew the guy who did it. The story about his dog, it was Douglas Crow. Yeah. He had his name changed from when he used to be the pastor of the church in town, but he, he performed the exorcism. And so, and so you were it, able yeah. to talk to him about that? Yes. Yes, I did. And did he feel like, I don't know that he really picked up on anything when he was there. Did he feel threatened or anything? No, he didn't. He didn't feel it, but he did believe the girls and mother's story, um, what was happening. He said he wholeheartedly believed that there was something going on there, so he did the exorcism. And as far as he knew, up until when I approached him and I interviewed with him, that, uh, you know, it was true that he did the exorcism. You but did talk to the girls la later in their, the daughters. The daughter, well, I, I'm trying to get an interview with him. I had received an email, just a, a, sh a short couple notes on it. But yeah, some sometime down the road, I would like to interview. Be interesting, wouldn't it? And, it would. Yeah. And so after he did that, the family said it went away, and they it were okay. Away. And then recently, more recently, 
the family, current family living there decided to do some renovations and it sounded like it all stirred back up again. Yes, that's what it sounds like. Because there was a story about a blanket that I thought was interesting that they'd found in the house. Oh, Melinda would throw it away and it would come back on its own. <laughs> right. And then she thought her husband was messing with her. <laughs> and, he, and like, why would he go take this blanket out? You know, I guess to be funny, but then he wasn't doing it. He's like, it's not me. And didn't they have to take it all the way to the dump or something before? Yeah, they, they, got, they threw it away to finally get rid of it. Then there was a, a chunk of lead or something that ended up on the steps that wasn't there. And his, her husband ended up cutting his foot. And then the cabinet, cabinet doors, I guess, were going. The dog was barking on the corner of a room at nothing. They don't, they don't know what was going on there. I did not go in that house because I know Melinda. She's a bartender up there. But I don't know what's in that house. It's off limits for me. I, I kind of actually retired from the investigation. What's one of your stories that really surprised you, especially when you looked into it? Because I just kind of like how everything kind of leads oh. you to from this person to that person, this story to that story. It went full circle. Once I talked to Mark Wilson up on the hill, and he, he connected the Amityville Horror House with the exorcist and i knew him so they can't and unfortunately doug ended up in the hospital he's over at the va hospital down in milwaukee now because there was a story in the book that actually made me laugh that you had met somebody and then you gave him a ride and and then you get pulled over and they thought that you were two robbers <laughs> and just Pete, Rob Pete Ryan. That, yeah. made, that made me laugh yeah, he was a good friend. And, I, you know, I'm looking at him because I just met him. And this guy was a real-life Jerry Maguire. He had so much energy on in him. And he just approached me at my cabin. And he starts talking about it. He goes, oh, this is a labor of love, this and this and that. Where do you work? And all of a sudden, he turns out he's an engineering headhunter. And he knew a lot of the people that I worked for. He knew my boss. He He hired my boss. And so before I knew it, I'm, I'm giving him a ride home in Cascade. And that's when we got pulled over. Then I'm starting to, hey, I really don't know this guy. So I'm having second thoughts in the cop up there. And he's got his hand like, on the gun and stuff. And I'm like, oh, crap. Did he really just rob someplace? You know, but in the book, I thought it was interesting, too, because, you know, it's a lot of ghost stories. And then you run into this guy, Ashley, I think was his name. And Ashley he was, Burnett. Yeah, and he was telling you about seeing Bigfoot or a Bigfoot because every state kind of has one that I don't know what they call it in Wisconsin. It seems like um, there's different names for different parts of the country, but I think he referred yeah. to it as Bigfoot. I just happened to go into uh, the meat market for an apple turnover. That's when they're warm. You get there early. <laughs> it, it, they're very good. And Ashley was, he, he works there. And I had a skunk ape shirt from down in Florida. That's what they call him down, down there. He says, I know his cousin. So I'm, I'm looking, I look to my left, I look to my right, and he's talking to me. And then I look down, and he, I realized what shirt I had on. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, that he had seen one up on the Lac du Flambeau Indian Reservation. So I'm like, wow, you know, I could tie that into the book. Yeah, that's kind of paranormal and stuff, you know. I interviewed him, and he said, I'll do you one better. I'll take you out there. So we did. We went out there, and we just took some measurements so we kind of knew the lay of the land and what he was talking about. We didn't see anything. Actually, the swamp there, the marsh, was very quiet, he says. He said, usually it's teeming with wildlife and stuff. He said it was just really, we didn't see nothing. It was like, so we didn't really see anything or anything like that, but I think that was in September, or maybe October. The news broke in the Bigfoot community back in December of the same year, which was like two months later. There was news that was a Bigfoot sighting, and it was almost the same exact spot we were in. So we missed it by a day. <laughs> Ashley thought that it was, um, they, they migrate. I could see that. Ashley, you know, it seems very matter of fact when you talk to him, he described it and 
He's like, I know how bears move and how bears walk across things. And this was on two feet. It was not on four. Bears wouldn't walk on two feet across something like that. It was like he sounded like someone who had seen something like a I, Bigfoot. I found him. I found him to be very credible. He had seen that seven years ago, and he was describing it like it was, you know, a week ago or a day ago. It was fresh in his memory. So uh, actually, he's a Ojibwe tribe. He's a uh, Native American. But he, unfortunately, we were setting up a second trip out there, and my buddy Scott, his son, had a uh, a drone and actually purchased the drone, and they we're going to go out there with both drones and we're going to take some aerials and see if we could come up with something. But unfortunately, Ashley passed away in his sleep. Oh, no. He had uh, sleep apnea. And he didn't look like he was a very old guy. That no. had to have been really surprising and he was, tragic. He was in his 40s or 50s. And a very, very personable, very nice guy. He had a smile that would, would light up a room. You know, he was a very nice guy. He, He's missed up there. And it's nice that he's acknowledged in this book. You know, there's a picture and he's in here and you tell his story. I think that's that's nice that he's in the that his story's in the book. I gave a copy to his mom because I had promised Ashley a, a copy of it. And after he passed away, I found out his mom owns a tavern up in the Lac du Flambeau Indian Reservation. So I went up there and I, I gave her a copy. I had the interview yet. So I played the interview for her, and then for her to hear her son's voice again, oh, it brought I brought that. But she gave me a big hug. But that meant a lot to her. And that wraps up part one of our conversation with Mark Palbicki about his book Haunted Lake Tomahawk. You can get the book on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can also visit his Facebook page and YouTube channel. Just search Haunted Lake Tomahawk. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. You can sign up today on Apple Podcasts and try it for three days free. You can also go to patreon.com slash thegravetalks and find everything there. I'm Carol Hughes, and for all of us at The Grave Talks, thank you for listening. Thank you.